Thank you, John. I, oh, John, you left your stuff up here. Does that mean it's mine now? <laughs> you do anything with WD-40, right? I mean, it's not WD-40, but something like it, I suppose. All right. Go ahead and turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 1. kind of a little bit worried sitting in this chair up here this morning. I don't know if it's just me, but I kept hoping, I hope this, I'm not going to go all the way down to the floor, (laughs) this kind of sink down as you sit in it. Uh, But I guess the Lord protect it. All right. The title of the message this morning is Being a Father to the Perfect Child. Has anyone ever said to you, you have the perfect child. I wish my little Billy would be just like your Tommy. And I just want to, you know, Everybody to understand right now. Now, some of you may find this hard to believe, but I'm not talking about myself. No one ever said that to my father or my mother. If anything, they would say something like, brother, we're praying for you. But the fact is, there are no perfect children. There are no perfect parents. There are no perfect grandparents. There's no perfect aunties or uncles. There's no perfect teachers. Yes, there's even no perfect preachers. But, now I'm going to turn it around 180 degrees. But there was one perfect child. The one who was born of a virgin. The one who had no sin nature. The one who was God in the flesh. And this is, of course, the Lord Jesus Christ. In this Father's Day message, we want to look, excuse me, look at a few qualities of the man who was the father, the human head of the home in which Jesus grew from a helpless infant into manhood. And of course, this man is Joseph, as we were, John read the passage there, just the end of the, uh, the lineage of, the, of Joseph and the Lord Jesus Christ, going back to uh, David through the royal line, and then eventually back to Abraham. Um, and oftentimes, Joseph gets eclipsed by Mary. Sometimes, you know, we don't even think about Joseph because, you know, people talk about Mary so much. And I mean, Mary was a very special woman. I mean, the, 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 the birth, the Holy Spirit coming upon her uh, and so forth. I mean, this was unique in all of human history. It was a, a miracle. It had never happened before. It will never happen again. But think about, we're going to think about Joseph today. Now, we don't know a lot about Joseph. We know that he was alive when Jesus was 12. We know that by the time that Jesus entered into his 
public ministry, which was about the age of 30, that Joseph was no longer around. So somewhere between uh, Jesus being the age of 12 and the age of 30, Joseph passed away. Okay? But he was very instrumental again in the raising up of Jesus again to live on this life and live on this world as a man, as a human being. And remember, there were times in past in the Old Testament we see Christ appearing before people as a man, but never before, never before his birth did he go through the whole process of being a human being, of being in the womb of Mary for nine months, of being you know, born and coming you know, into the, the world, of you know, being a helpless infant, and, and so forth and so on, until he became a man. We're going to look just a few. You know, we don't have a lot of information about Joseph. We do see a few qualities that Joseph had, this man that God chose, not in the same way he chose Mary, but he chose him for a very special purpose and ministry that can help all of us, all of us, whether your father, mother, auntie, uncle, or just, you know, you have, there's young people who you, whose lives you've touched can help all of us in this area. The first thing we're going to see, if you go down to, we're still in Matthew 1, and go down to verse 18. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise. When, as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph. Okay, now spousal was much more than engagement, right? You get engaged to somebody and you decide, ah, this person isn't the one, okay? I mean, all you got to do is send them a text, right? And say, you know, goodbye, don't want to see you anymore. See you later, alligator, not too soon, baboon. And if you have the ring, maybe mail it back to him, whatever, okay? But to break an espousal, well, let me back up a little bit. To be a spouse was a legal process. And to break an espousal would require a divorce. It would require going to the law and annulling this union under the law. Now, under espousement, the man and woman were not yet living together. It was a time for the man to be, pre be, be preparing a home. And when the home was ready, he would go with a wedding party and go to uh, the, the woman's house, and he would take her to be with him, to be his wife. They would have their, you know, the wedding supper and so forth, and then they would be their marriage as husband and wife. And, you know, one thing we're going to see here in a couple verses, one quality of Joseph is that he would think before he responded. You know, a lot of people hearing that, you know, you're a spoused wife that you've never been with, at least in a, a, a physical relationship, you've never been with her, and she's pregnant. And a lot of people would, I mean, you could just picture somebody, you know, pounding the table. I'm going to kill her. I'm going to kill him. 
Now today it's words, right? And unfortunately, sometimes it's carried through. But at this time that the Bible was written, you know, Joseph could have carried these things out if he just did a knee-jerk reaction to it. God wants us to think something through before we react. Susan works with toddlers, toddlers and very young children. And you know, at that age, they're all self-centered, right? The whole universe revolves around me. And if something, somebody's doing something I don't like or says something, you know, hit them <laughs> or kick them or push them. And one of the things that Susan tries to teach the kids is use your words first. Now, as adults, it's a little bit more than just using your words. Using your words means, okay, you're going to think about it a little bit, right? Think about, well, what is this situation? Why am I feeling bad about it? But to think before we react. Let's look a little bit more in here. When as his mother Mary was a spouse to Joseph before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. So this was a miraculous con conception. Uh, and this was the only, well, Abraham and Sarah kind of had a miraculous conception, but there was still, the man was still involved in it, right? Uh, but beyond their old age. But this was the only miraculous conception of this kind, where there was no man, there was no male, that this conception took place totally within the woman as the Holy Spirit brought this miracle into being. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man, just means he's a righteous man. He's a man who knows and loves God. He's a man who wants to do what's right. Now, I don't know if those of you who saw the video this morning, you know, and uh, Ron Comfer was talking to people, and towards the end, he's talking to them about getting saved. And of course, the whole, the main point of the video was, you know, some problems with evolution. But he says, you know, forget evolution. You know, Trust in Christ, receive the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, and then He will show you what is right and what is true. And so Joseph was a just man. Now, he was thinking, and he was not willing to make her a public example. He could have done that. Right? He could have made a big public display. He could have announced to all the, the city there, you know, Mary uh, was a spouse to me. We never had any physical, but she's pregnant. Somehow she got pregnant even without me. And in fact, if he took it to the final extreme, he could have had her under the law of Moses executed. Just like when they... they the Pharisees brought the, the woman caught in adultery to the Lord, and they were ready to stone her to death. And when they stoned people, they weren't throwing like, you know, river rocks at her. I mean, they were throwing huge, almost boulders at the person that would crush their bones and ultimately kill them. He could have had all that done at that time. If you knew who the man was, of course, in this case, it's God's, it's not a man, but if you know who the man is, I mean, the same thing could be done to him because he's an adulterer also, right? But he's, he's thinking, he's, he's not willing to make a public example of her, but he was thinking about divorcing her privately just quietly, just going and get the annulment. Nobody has to know. There doesn't have to be. Now, people, of course, are going to find out, but I'm not going to make a big public display 
about it. I'm not going to go to CNN or Fox News, you know, and have it on the evening newscast, okay? It's going to be privately. Just annul this relationship and move on from there. So Joseph was a thoughtful man. Even facing very difficult circumstances, instead of reacting, he stopped and he thought. And I'm sure included in that thought, it doesn't say it, I'm sure included in that thought was seeking God's will and praying to the Lord. The second quality we see about Joseph is that he obeyed God's word. He obeyed God's word. Uh, if we continue on in verse 20, it says, But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. Now, does God speak to people in dreams? He did. There are many instances in the scripture where God speaks to individuals through dreams. Remember in Hebrews, it tells us there that in times past, God spoke to the Father in diverse or many ways at many times. People didn't have, you know, a Bible you know, or Bibles in their home. If you had all the scriptures, even the Old Testament scriptures, you would probably have to have another separate house just to hold it in. Okay, but people didn't have the word. Now you could hear the word at the synagogue, at the temple, and so forth. Sometimes even the synagogues didn't have all the scriptures. But, um, but God would speak to people in the Old Covenant. Uh, and in this case, in the case of Joseph, he would speak to him in a dream. That was different with Mary, right? The verse, or many ways. With Mary, the angel Gabriel came directly to her and gave her the news that she was going to bear the Son of God. But here, God sends an angel to speak to Joseph in a dream but while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David. So again, here's this royal lineage. And because Joseph was a royal son of David, then Jesus would also be in line to be a royal son of Joseph, even though he wasn't a biological son, he was still the first son in the family, so he would be the son of David. Sometimes he's referred to as the son of David. And he says, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife. Now, why would Joseph have to have any fear about taking Mary? Well, Joseph wouldn't be facing the same thing as Mary but, you know, if he, if he went ahead knowing she's pregnant, knowing she's going to have a child, takes her as his wife, it could be something that people consider shameful. Could be something people consider being weak. Uh, there could be family members who say, Joseph, we really don't think we can have anything to do with you anymore. There could have been, he could have lost business. Uh, you know, I don't think we should, you know, have our um, oxen yoke built by Joseph, we're going to go over here to, you know, Zeke's carpenter shop uh, to have our things made from now on. So there was a reason to fear. But he says, fear not. Don't be afraid. Don't be, don't feel. This is something you can't do. To take unto thee, marry thy wife. And he tells her the reason for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. There's no adultery here. God did not commit adultery with Mary. This was a miraculous event. There is one, 
Now, I, I, you know, the group, now their, their doctrines change sometimes from week to week and month to month. But there's one group that was teaching at least at one time that God actually took the form of a man, came to Mary, had sex with her, and Jesus was born. Now, if that was the case, God would have been an adulterer, and Mary would be an adulteress. But there's no adultery here, okay? It's a miraculous event. It's a work of the Holy Spirit in Mary. In verse 21, and she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus. You know, in the early parts of Matthew and Luke, there's two individuals who were born that God told them what the name of the son would be, of course, here, God told Joseph through the angel that you're going to call his name Jesus, Savior, because he will save his people from their sins. Uh, the Old Testament name is uh, Joshua, Yeshua. Um, and there were, you know, if you read through that genealogy, I don't think there's any Joshua's in there. Usually they would give people family names. The Scholzes did that a lot. I had two Uncle Johns and I had a cousin named Johnny. Okay? Because it was a family name. Um, but his name became Jesus. The other one was John the Baptist. Uh, when God revealed to Zacharias that Elizabeth, Elizabeth was going to have a son, and he said, in his name will be John. And when Elizabeth gave birth, and the people looked at Zacharias, remember, Zacharias couldn't talk for some time, but God opened his mouth, and people looked at Zacharias and said, what, what are you going to call him? And Zacharias said, John. People were kind of amazed, because of you don't have any John in your family. But anyway, here in this verse, it uh, goes on to say, And she is bringing forth a son, thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Now all this was done, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us in fulfillment of prophecy. Isaiah 7, 14 is where we find uh, this prophecy. In verse 24, Then Joseph, being raised from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him and took unto him his wife. We don't see any hesitation there. We don't see Joseph say, well, Lord, let me think about this for a little bit. No, he arose and he went and he took Mary to be his wife. Okay, because he knew this was the word of God. Now, I got to say this because, I mean, there are people today who claim that God spoke to them in a dream I heard the testimony of some, somebody one time who said, well, I, I know I'm saved because I had this dream where Jesus told me he loved me. So I'm saved. Sorry. The word, the gospel doesn't come through dreams. Now, you might dream about something somebody said to you, but faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Okay? And... If God were to speak to somebody in a dream, it would be totally in line with his word. And here, you know, the Lord qualifies it, right? Uh, the angel qualifies it with the, the prophecy from Isaiah. So he obeyed God's word. He thought before he, re he acted. He obeyed God's word. A third quality we see if we go over to Matthew 2. 
and starting and go to verse 13. And here we said, he led his home as God led him. He led his home as God led him. Verse 13, now the previous verses where the wise men come, uh, they come to worship uh, Jesus. They come bringing tribute to him, acknowledging him as the King of kings and Lord of lords, the sovereign of all creation. Now, in verse 13 says, And when they were departed, behold, the angel of the Lord appeareth to Joseph in a dream. Okay, so this apparently is how God speaks to Joseph, is in a dream. Saying, Arise and take the young child and his mother, and flee into Egypt, and be thou there until I bring thee word, for Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. When he arose, he took the young child and his mother by night, and they departed into Egypt. I find it so interesting that God is directing this family, Joseph, Mary, Jesus. Now, they are going to have other children. There is no indication here that they have any of their other children yet. But he's directing this family not through Mary. Some people would think, oh, Mary's the one who's going to lead. No, Mary was not the head of this home. Joseph was the head of the home. And God was the head of Joseph. And God led this family through the human father, Joseph. God tells Joseph to flee into Egypt. Herod's going to seek uh, to kill uh, this child. And again, like he did previously, hearing God's word, no hesitation, no stopping to think about it. This is God's word, and this is what I'm going to do. And this is what my family is going to do. He led his home. And let's also look at another passage. Um, same chapter, but go down to verse 19. But when Herod was dead, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt. It doesn't matter where you're at. God can still speak to you, right? You can speak to him when he's in Judea. You can speak to him when he's in Egypt. Um, saying, verse 20, Arise and take the young child and his mother and go into the land of Israel, for they are dead which sought thy child's life. And he arose and took the young child and his mother and came to the land of Israel. And then in verse um, 22, but when he heard that Archelaus did reign in Judea in the room of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there, to go back to Judea. Notwithstanding, being warned of God in a dream, again, so here God is again warning him in a dream, he turned aside into parts of Galilee. Okay, so this is where Joseph decided as being led by God, I'm not going to go back to Judea, you know, the Herodian dynasty is too close there. Um, and he goes up to Galilee instead. And by the way, in doing that, you know, is the fulfillment of prophecy. If you leave, read the um, last verse there, he came and dwelt in this city called Nazareth that might be fulfilled, which is spoken by the prophets, and she'll be called a Nazarene. Uh, there's also another prophecy. They don't bring it out here, but you know, talks about um, Naphtali. There'll be a light to all people in Naphtali and 
Zebulun. Well, Naphtali and Zebulun were tribes of ancient Israel, uh, but this is the region where, you know, Galilee was as well. And, you know, when the, later on the Pharisees said, you know, can anything good come from Galilee? Yes. In fact, God said something very good is going to come uh, from Galilee. So he led his home as God leaded him. You know, sometimes we call, I, I don't know if anybody uses this phrase anymore. It's kind of misogynist, but, you know, they used to say a man's home is his castle. It's really not, right? It's God's castle. It ought to be God's castle. And you're just one of God's servants leading this home as God leads you. Okay, another quality we see of Joseph. Now we need to go to the book of Luke. Luke chapter 2. And we're going to start reading in verse 1. Oops. Oops. I knew I should have brought my print Bible. Try this again. So sorry. Okay, why aren't you cooperating with me? Luke chapter 2. Verse 1. It's not going. Luke chapter 2, verse 1. And the thing we see here is that Joseph was obedient to the civil government. And it came to pass in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. In the King James it says taxed, right? But actually this is more of a census. And the census first took place when Quirinius was governing Syria. So all went to be reg registered, everyone to his own city, in the city of your ancestors. Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth unto Judea to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and the lineage of God. So a decree is made by that wonderful Christian leader, Caesar Augustus. No, if you think the Democrats are bad, you should have seen what the Roman Republicans did to people. I know, it's different Republicans than today. I thought that's an interesting wording. But, you know, that didn't matter. Because a, a legal decree was given, and as a, a subject of this emperor required obedience to the decree. The only exception would be if, the, if it was involved you know, doing something sinful involved maybe worshiping an idol or worshiping the, uh, this emperor or whatever, something like that, uh, or murdering children, okay? But there's nothing sinful here, okay? And as believers in Jesus Christ, we have a responsibility to obey the civil 
government. Okay, it doesn't matter what party is in control. Doesn't matter how much you love or hate your leader or your leaders. But we are obligated to obey the civil authorities over us. Why? Because God has put them in that place. Has God put Joe Biden in the office of president? I have to say yes. I don't know why. But he's there because God put him there, not because he won an election. Okay, that's just the outward form, but there's something much more powerful behind that. And in fact, if you turn to, we're not going to look at Romans 13 today, but when you get a chance, look at Romans 13. And it says there that those who enforce the civil law, now I'm, I'm kind of paraphrasing a little bit here, but those who enforce the civil law are ministers of God. When Ken worked as a police officer, he was a minister of God. Any police officer out there, whether they're good or bad or saved or not, by enforcing the law, they are ministers of God. And the next time you get stopped by a police Maybe I shouldn't say the next time, because that kind of implies this has happened you know, several times. But if you ever get stopped by a police officer and you roll down your window, and one thing you can tell him or her is, I'm praying for you. What? Yeah, the Bible tells me you are a minister of God, and I support you, and I'm praying for you. Now, it doesn't mean they're going to let you go with a warning. They might, maybe, okay? Uh, but it's a truth. It's a truth. And Joseph recognized uh, this truth. And let's just read a little bit more here. So all went to be registered, everyone's own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea to the city of David. It's called Bethlehem because he was of the house and lineage of David. So again, Joseph is leading his family, but this time it wasn't a direct revelation from God. This time it wasn't, you know, that God came to him, sent an angel in a dream and said, go down to, but it was through Caesar and Caesar's decree. And if you think about that, that's astounding that God is using Caesar, Caesar Augustus, to fulfill his will. By this decree, Joseph would go down to Bethlehem. I mean, you know, and again, you could say, oh, wait a minute, Mary's about ready to, get, to give birth. I don't want her riding on some bumpy donkey or cart. But because there's the law behind it, he does it. And then again, prophecy is fulfilled. Jesus is born in Bethlehem as was prophesied and by the prophet Micah. And the last quality we're going to look at today is that he led and joined his family in the worship of God. Still in Luke 2, but go down to verse 41. His parents, now Joseph and Mary are kind of doing this together now. His parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast 
of the Passover. Now, I understand it's just one event, and it's a very special event for the Jews. Um... His parents went to Jerusalem every year at the Feast of the Passover. And when he was 12 years old, that's Jesus, they went up to Jerusalem according to the custom of the feast. You know, Joseph didn't say to Mary and Jesus, you know, and there are probably other children at this point. You know, you guys go down. I just have I got so much work to do. I'm getting so many orders. I, go, I have to fulfill. So you guys go down and I'll be here when you get back. By the way, the Jews always, when going to Jerusalem, they always say up. doesn't matter what direction you're coming from. If you're going to Jerusalem, you're going up. Okay? Um, but, um, but he didn't. He was with them. He was joining them in this special time, this special worship of the Lord. In the mid-20th century, there was an artist named Norman Rockwell. You have probably seen his paintings. He painted basically, I guess what you call Americana, just scenes from everyday American life. And there's one picture that he painted called Sunday Morning. And in this picture in the front is a man, husband, father, kind of slouching on a living room chair, still in his robe and his jammies, Sunday papers brewed all around. And then behind him is his wife and three children. They're all dressed in their Sunday go to meeting clothes. They're all carrying Bibles under their arms. Now the wife and two daughters kind of have their noses maybe stuck up a little bit in the air. But the son, the son is looking at his father. And you got to imagine what the son is thinking. But to me, it's a look that's saying, I can't wait to be a man like my daddy. I can't wait until I don't have to do this Sunday school and church stuff anymore. And I can just slouch around on Sunday morning. And I can read the Sunday newspaper or whatever I want to do or pull it up on my phone or whatever. But, and you know, that became the scenario in a lot of American homes. You know that in worship, the Father was absent. Praise God for a church like this, where the fathers, the husbands, the men lead their homes in worship. The five qualities we've looked at that he would think before he reacted. He obeyed God's word. He led his home as God led him. He obeyed the civil law. And he led and joined his family in worship of God. These five qualities of Joseph can be summed up in the word godliness. Godliness is not something we obtain by following a set of rules or participating in rituals and ceremonies, or doing good works. It is something that God imputes to us when we come to him as a lost sinner and receive his Son as our Savior and Lord. It is Christ in you. It is his light shining through your life. Fathers, I could be talking to anybody here, right? Well, since it's Father's Day, I'll say fathers. Fathers, what do you want your children to remember about you? Well, you know, it's, 
his skill. He was so skillful with tools. He could build just about anything. Oh, my father was so smart. He must have been a genius. He knew more than anybody else. Maybe your athleticism. And my father, he could have been a quarterback for the Philadelphia Eagles. And they would have won the Super Bowl. <laughs> Maybe your jokes. My, my father was around. Everybody always laughed. There's not anything necessarily wrong with any of these things. But what about being remembered because your child saw Christ in you. You might say, but oh, I have so many flaws. Yeah, we all have wrinkles and blemishes and big, green, ugly warts. And some of us have them on the outside as well. But the light of Jesus can in us can shine through all of that and be a beacon of truth to all around us. Our closing today is going to be a little different. We're not going to have any musicians come up. John's not going to come up. I'm going to ask that everyone would please, if you can, if you would please stand at your seats to go ahead and stand and bow your heads. I'm going to read the words of a song. I'm going to read them. I'm not going to sing them. I'm going to read the words of a song. And as I read these words, I just want you to think about this. Think about maybe those who have in whose life you've seen Jesus. Maybe how, maybe I can be better, that Jesus uh, can be seen even more through me. The name of the song is I Saw Jesus in You by Ron Hamilton. And it says, when I enter heaven's glory, and I see my Savior's face. I will offer him 10,000 years of praise. Then I'll find that special one. In whose life I saw God's Son. And through tears of joy with trembling lips, these words I'll say, I saw Jesus in you. I saw Jesus in you. I could hear his voice in the words you said. I saw Jesus in you. In your eyes I saw his care. I could see his love was there. You were faithful, and I saw Jesus in you. Father in heaven, whether we're here today as fathers or in some other capacity in which we touch the lives of children and young people and even others around us, Father, we pray that you would Enable us to grow in grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That the light that you put in us, Christ in you, the hope, and glory, the hope of glory would shine through even more. Touch more lives. Accomplish your will. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Before you go, just... A thought, if you are with somebody or some bodies today, this afternoon, in whose life you see or have seen Jesus, don't wait 10,000 years to tell them. Tell them today. 
Thank them. Thank them for seeing Jesus in you. Maybe even give them a little hug. Have a great Father's Day. You're dismissed.